I could have lived a life of mediocrity. So it's highly unreasonable that a guy that's voted least likely to succeed should have succeeded. But the only reason I succeeded is because I became unreasonable and I did everything everyone told me I shouldn't do because I did not want to settle for being average. You're listening to the Move to Millions podcast with Dr. Darnielle J. Harmon. If you're ready for high-level conversations that position and prepare you to move your company, cash flow and connection to and beyond the million dollar mark, let's get this party started. This episode is powered by Move to Millions, the book. OMG, I cannot wait for you to get your hands on your copy of Move to Millions. You already know this is the book I was born to write. Grab it now at movetomillionsbook.com. And here's what I need you to know. The bonuses are going to run out. These exclusive bonuses are going to run out for you to get them as a bonus. If you wait until the book releases, you're gonna have to pay to get access to the private podcast and the bonus trainings and everything that I've designed to help you to get your business solidly to and beyond the million dollar mark. Move to millionsbook.com. I have a treat for you today. My guest, Brandon Dawson. Okay, y'all. So let me just say, first and foremost, I had never heard of Brandon Dawson until about maybe two weeks ago. A member of my team brought his information to me and was like, you have got to have him on the podcast. So I started doing my research and my due diligence. And y'all, I really think that he's my brother from another mother. The way he talks, what he talks about, the level of passion and conviction that he holds for business and business owners, unparalleled. He talked about, and I, y'all know I normally don't tell you anything about the episode until you listen to the episode, but this conversation was so good, so rich, so fulfilling that I just want to share with you that his recommendation for you is that you become unrealistic. Now, you're going to have to listen in to find out exactly what it is that I mean. Let me take a quick moment and read you some of Brandon's bio. Because again, he is amazing. He is a serial entrepreneur and business leader with a passion for helping business owners amplify their vision and impact through belief, strategy, and team alignment. Does that sound like parts of the move to millions method? I keep trying to tell y'all, I don't care how you get to seven figures, eight figures, nine figures, you need the move to millions method. You need strategy, sales, systems, support, and success mindset in order to do it. Brandon says, I am constantly evolving. I live by the belief that if someone has already figured something out, why not replicate the best of the best and then expand and amplify it for greater impact? I love Brandon Dawson. And I believe that as you listen in to this powerful conversation and learn his story about how he has taken his company and sold it for 77 times EBITDA, listen, Get your pen, get your Move to Millions podcast notebook, and dig in to my conversation with Brandon Dawson. Brandon Dawson, oh my goodness. I am so excited to welcome you to the Move to Millions podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Yes, I am really excited to dig into your book. But before we even go there, the first thing I always like to do for everyone that I bring on is in your own words, beyond your success, what would you want our listeners to know about who Brandon is? Well, I think I think the most important thing is that what inspires me, motivates me, drives me is taking the knowledge, information, and success I've had and multiplying it through other people because that's that's why I'm doing what I'm doing at this point. It's more of a cause than it is than it is the monetary aspect of it. If I can help people save businesses, 97% of all businesses fail within 10 years. If I can change that, because when a business fails, 93% are owned by family members. And so when mm-hmm. there's family involved, if a business fails, the family unit gets suffers. And when the family unit suffers, they actually the community suffers. So I'm in the business of saving businesses because it saves families. And, and I think that my own personal experiences have exemplified that. So that's what I'm passionate about. That's what inspires me every single day is to help people create massive value and do it the right way in their business. 
I love that. And that was the first thing that I read when I went to your website was behind the life you want lies the power you already have inside to create it. And I feel like everything you just said is a culmination of all of the adversity and obstacles you've had to overcome in order to get to this place today where it's not about the money, it's about the impact, right? It's about moving other people into a level of success. And I can totally understand that because that is the way that I live my life as well. I would love it if you would take us back. I was listening to one of the videos that were on your site and I would love for you to share what happened when you were 16 in the Walnut Orchard and how that has shaped the man that you have become today. Many multiples of millions of dollars, many lives impacted, many families restored because of the work that it is that you do. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I got grounded from my parents for for breaking curfew. I'd go to school and I have football practice and then I worked at the night deposit restaurant as a busboy. And my curfew was 1230 and and I had a girlfriend that was going to the Oregon State University. And, and so I was sneaking over to see her on the way home. And I started breaking curfew and my dad busted me and they were going out of town. So my dad, as part of my being grounded, he told me to pick the walnut orchard and uh, I hated those walnuts. And so I was like, oh man, there's no way I'm going to be able to go to school, do football practice, work at work at the night deposit. And then my weekends now are blown because I got to be picking up walnuts, harvesting the walnuts. And my family needed those walnuts. We made about $5,500 a year and we needed that money for my little brothers and I go to, to go to the little Christian school we went to. Mm-hmm. And so my parents left Friday morning to go to Bend, Oregon. I went to school and there was a note on, on the lockers and it was from the senior class. They were doing a senior fund drive to try to raise $1,000 for them to do their senior class. And I, that was my first entrepreneurial idea. I went to the senior class. The president of the senior class was a buddy of mine. We were co-captains on the football team. And I said, hey, if you guys come help me pick up some wallets, I'll donate some money. And, and he's like, great. And I thought, boy, if I can do this, maybe next weekend, I can go spend some time with my girlfriend before my parents get back. But what happened is not only did, uh, and I went to a very small school, so the whole senior class was 35 people. Okay. So, so not only did the president of the football team show up, but he brought almost the whole senior class who brought their brothers, their sisters, and their parents. There were 150 people that showed up. And we picked that orchard absolutely clean. Now, I hated walnuts because they always stained my hand and it was gross and it was cold and I hated doing it. And and over the course of the weekend, everyone worked feverishly picking the walnuts, de-husking. I just drove around the tractor and, sh- and had them shovel the husks into the tractor, went to the burn pile. I even got so bored and there was nothing to do that I started pruning the trees which normally didn't happen until later. I just rotated and then had them throw the branches in the trash. So the walnut orchard was pristine because all those people attacked it with me. And I hated those walnuts, but those people had so much joy. And it dawned on me that the joy wasn't because of the walnuts. It was because they were able to spend time with their family. Mm -hmm. And the parents were able to help their kids raise the money to go on the senior trip. So observing all of this, and it's creating an impression, but see, here's the thing. We don't know until we look back in time at some point in time, in our present moment, we look back like, where'd I learn that? Well, in the moment, you don't really learn it. You might observe it. It's till it's not till later where you're like, where did I, oh, wait, it was the damn walnut orchard because it taught me some very specific principles. And number one is the more people you throw at a problem, the faster it can get done. Yeah, that's good. The second principle it taught me was even the things you hate doing can create life for other people. And so a lot of business owners get burned out with their business or they hate doing their business. It's because they're doing it alone. If they bring more people and allow them to achieve their life, their personal, professional, and financial goals through the business, people will breathe life into the business and then it makes it fun. Absolutely. The other thing is, is that at the end of all this, the parents said, hey, we want to buy these walnuts. Normally, I'd have to go down to the street and put a sign up and put a picnic table out and sell bags, 50-pound bags of walnuts, Peoria Road, and people driving by, but not this year. The parents bought all the walnuts. And I didn't, I wasn't smart enough to figure out how to use a calculator to figure out the price. I just made the price up and they bought them all. And instead of 5,500, it was 8,500 because I screwed up on how much I charged them. 
but no one cared about the price because they just wanted to once again reinforce to the kids we're supporting you yeah all this information i learned in that one situation which i have carried on with business price is only an issue in the absence of value yeah prices are made up you can charge whatever price you want as long as you give the value the more people you throw at a problem faster it gets solved and the more aligned people are with the mission the more inspired they'll be to complete it all those four principles learned from walnuts that I hated, that I now have applied in all aspects of my business life and has turned has allowed me to come up, you know, nine figure net worth. And it all goes back to those stupid walnuts. <laughs> I mean, so many things, even in addition to the lessons you just pulled out for everyone, which are amazing. And I know everyone will listen back to this episode multiple times just to catch everything you've just dropped. But two things stood out for me. Number one, people support what they help to create. So you're creating this and reinforcing community. And then number two, collaboration. And I know you talk a lot about the role that collaboration plays in taking a business to the next level, to nine <laughs> figures, if that's the ultimate goal of the business. And I think it's amazing how this one thing based on breaking curfew, wanting to spend time with your boo, turned into these life lessons that you've been able to utilize throughout your entire career. And I know many of them are also rolled up in your new book. So take a moment and tell us all about Nine Figure Mindset. Why yeah, did you so, write it? Why do people need to read it? Good question. I worked on it for over 10 years. I started the manuscript of this book in 2009. And I just felt like I wasn't ready yet to, to deliver it because I hadn't put the final exclamation point on my career. Stuck on the six-figure plateau? It's time that you cross over the million-dollar milestone with grace and ease. Part memoir and part methodology, Move to Millions, the proven framework to become a million-dollar CEO with grace and ease instead of hustle and grind, helps entrepreneurs and business owners simplify their processes to multiply their profits. Known for breaking down complex topics, I equip you with all that you need to leave the headaches of scaling your business behind so that you can be empowered and edified without compromising any of your values in the process. It is time for you to make the move to millions. Grab your copy today at movetomillionsbook.com. My first business I took public when I was 29 years old and I acquired 130 businesses and raised $40 million as a guy that barely got out of high school. And I was voted least likely to succeed. And when I told people I'm going to do some big things, everyone said it was a joke and I'd never do it, right? So at the end of the day, here I am at 29 years old. I've acquired hundreds of businesses. I have a public company. I've raised tens of millions of dollars with some of the most prestigious financial institutions in the world. Well, well beyond what anybody would have ever assumed or even I would have ever thought I would have done. Only to have it all taken away from me by the age of 32 because my private equity group basically sold my company and I didn't have a business anymore. And so I had to start over, but I went into this funk. And here's the thing that I'll say, and the reason it's mindset, your actions follow your beliefs. If you believe high, you'll achieve higher than if you believe low, because you're going to put more energy into it. Right. Your belief, though, is reinforced and stimulated by your operational effectiveness, how good you are at something. And then that will be determined based on your me leadership which then when you get bigger, spills over to we leadership, which then becomes us leadership as the organization, as the culture sticks in the organization. So I started based on all my mistakes and my being a victim and everything, I reformulated through some of my mentors how to think and, and how to set new targets and how to find the right type of mentors and then how to learn from those mentors and then how to apply what I learned from the mentors. And so I rebuilt myself with the intention I wanted to be the best version of myself because I was not before, which is why ultimately the private equity group, I had to own the fact that they got nervous that I was beyond my skis and they sold the business because they were afraid I might have screwed it up. Mm -hmm. So I had to own that. And then I had to ask the question, how do I create confidence and not make people nervous? And how do I really have awareness and understanding about the things that I'm not really that good about. And I realized I wasn't good at leadership and I wasn't good at finances and I wasn't good at operations. And so I found mentors to help me shore that up. So I took my assets, I identified my liabilities, and then I converted my liabilities 
into bigger assets than my original assets were in the first place. And I made a decision. I was going to build a company using very specific principles, Mm -hmm. a principle of not using anybody else's money, a principle of not giving up control of my organization, a principle of helping others succeed in business and not lose control of their business. And so I said, if I could do that for me, I can teach everybody how to do it, but I have to be the example first. So I launched that business in 2005. And the reason I started the book in 2009 is I was on the Inc. 500, Inc. 5000. I was multiple entrepreneur of the year, Ernst and Young in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. But I hadn't yet demonstrated that I could build a high valued business system helping other business owners in 2013, 14, 15. And I felt like I needed to have closed the loop on that. So I sold my business in 2016 for 77 times EBITDA, 151 million, a business that generated 50 million of profits and scaled, never borrowed a dime, never raised a penny, never had a non-profitable week, month, quarter, or year. And I did it helping other business owners create massive value in their businesses. And I shared the success of my company with my customers instead of raising capital with investors. And it was one of the highest prices ever paid for a business. And then I took a billion dollar company that I deployed this into and helped grow it to four and a half billion in 36 months on a global basis. And so by then I'm like, I did it. Mm -hmm. It's time for the book. And then we partnered with Grant and Elena Cardone to bring what I've built to the masses. And I'm already working on the second and third book. And my mentor, John Maxwell said, Brandon, if you don't get your book, first book out, by the time you put your first book out, it won't be relative because you'll be on to your second and your third and your fourth and your fifth. So I decided to complete the book and John Maxwell said, I'm going to help you. And he wrote the forward to my book, but it literally tells the story of how I reshaped my thinking. So my doing could follow the right kind of thinking. And I multiplied my impact through hundreds and then thousands of other people. And really my story isn't about me, it's about what I learned and then how I was able to help other people and what their successes were. And so this book frames that so that people will understand the second book and the third book because I'm working on a trilogy right now. Yeah, I understand all of that. I appreciate all of that. I too have just written a book. It comes out after your book comes out. And I feel you because I felt the same way. I call it in my book, I call it those Moses moments, right? If you know the story of Moses in the Bible, him not feeling like he was the person that God should send to go talk to Pharaoh and how even though he had done some really amazing, powerful things, he still questioned. And similarly, when I first got the mandate to write my book, which is called Move to Millions, I was like, I'm not sure if I should be doing this. And then it became really clear the point at which I had accomplished to be able to not theorize what it would look like for someone to get their business to the million dollar mark and be able to sustain it. So I can definitely appreciate that. And I know I'm looking forward to reading the book. I've already ordered my copy, so I cannot wait for it to arrive. Just so inspired to think about what you've been able to accomplish and the amount of adversity you've overgone in your own life to come to where you are today. So you're known for saying that Success isn't about working harder, and I 150% agree, but instead it's about ensuring that you strive towards the right goals in the right direction. So what are a few of the first steps that anyone, because I believe that you have to have an accelerated mindset. If if I want to get to seven figures, my mindset needs to be at eight or nine so that I can live into and, and operate in it. And I love what you just said. When you reshape your thinking, the doing that you do it becomes effortless to a certain extent, right? So what are some of the steps? If I were wanting to get started and I'm wanting to adopt a nine-figure mindset, what are maybe the first two to three things I might need to do in order to help and aid that journey to be able to have my business, my goals, and my aspirations catch up to the mindset that I'm living from every single day? It's a great question. So, you know, in order to have a nine-figure mindset, you have to have a six-figure mindset. And then in order to have a nine-figure mindset, you have to shift to a seven-figure mindset. And then for a nine-figure mindset, you have to shift to an eight-figure mindset. And then that will propel you to a nine-figure mindset. Now, people say, okay, that sounds easy to talk about, but how does it happen practically? Well, a six-figure mindset is all about you. It's like, how can I generate a hundred grand and and make a hundred grand? Now, setting targets is really super important because having a six-figure mindset, you could be doing six figures in revenue and not make a lot of money. You could have a six-figure net worth 
but not have the cash. You can have six figures of cash or you have six figures of income. Those are different things. Absolutely. And I say a low six figure business is small business poverty. You cannot be the change you want to see when you don't have any. So I totally get that. Yeah, hundred percent. So first, what I talk about is setting the right targets. Mm -hmm. So a nine figure mindset, I defined that not as I have a nine figure business, but as I have nine figures in the bank because I validated whatever I built. Okay. Right. So, so first set your right target. So if you have a six figure mindset, it's not, oh, I want to make six figures. It's, it's better to say, I want six figures of cash in the bank because that yeah. makes you earn more. Right. Correct. Yeah. So it's easy to let yourself off when you set these targets that are actually easy to get to. So six figure target. So first I would say set your target based on your, your net worth, your cash in the bank. Okay. Not your equity in your building or whatever, but cash in the bank, like mm -hmm. pick the hardest of the six figure. So six figures is also a spread between a hundred thousand and 999,000. So right. pick what six figure you're targeting. Right. Is it $500,000? Is it nine? Point nine nine nine, like like pick what that six figure because six figure is a broad spectrum. Correct. Now, once you've learned to do that, to get to seven figures, you just need to teach three to five other people to do what you did. Because now, what happens is, as you go to a nine figure mindset, in the purest form, a nine figure mindset means that you've been able to teach hundreds of other people to get to six, seven, and eight figures. Because you realize a nine and 10 figure mindset is actually accomplished through other people. So to understand that a nine figure mindset is how many people can I multiply and amplify through versus what I can do. Mm -hmm. A six and seven figure mindset is what I'm doing. And so the more people, more output amplifies input. So if I, my output is helping other people learn to be six, seven and eight figure earners, the input is I'm gonna have more people making me more money because yeah. I'm helping them and they're thrilled with what I'm making because I'm helping them make so much more. So now a 10 figure mindset is taking that to another level, right? So, right. so my trilogy is nine figure mindset. Then it's going to be the 10 X operating system. It's how we build and scale businesses. It's the blueprint. Okay. And then it's mm -hmm. the next book that will come out after that's the 10 figure mindset. Because by the time I write my second book, I'll be worth over a billion dollars. So, nice. so to me, it's like, it's all about who you move through, not what you do. I love that. And based on your definition of a nine figure mindset, I just want to let you know that I have a nine figure mindset Great. because in my work, I take a six figure service based entrepreneurs to seven figures. And we've been able to help hundreds of people to accomplish that's cool. that. And really cool. That's why you got those little, you know, success isn't invisible. Yes. That's why you have those ink. Behind you, I'm a seven-time Inc. 500, 5,000. So I, awesome. when I see that, I appreciate it. I know how hard it is to get on that list. Yeah, yeah. This is our second year in a row. So we've consistently had about 530% growth over a three-year span Good for, for the last six yep. years, which is really powerful. So That's thank awesome. you for, for acknowledging that. Part of your philosophy is the concept of kind of what we just talked about. I want to go a little bit deeper of unrealistic targets as a catalyst for innovation, for breaking through barriers and achieving unprecedented success. Now, I think for a lot of people who will listen to this, they can't even really begin to wrap their minds around what it looks like at nine figures. So it might seem daunting for them. And as a result, it might even feel like it's a little counterintuitive. Why is being unrealistic the best strategy someone could employ to move their life or business forward? Great question. Just remember that I was voted least likely to succeed from a little tiny town where I was told I should go get a job working at the, at the tire and wheel shop because I didn't have the abilities to go do anything big. See, mm -hmm. reasonableness will always drive you to mediocrity. Oh, okay. Hold on. Hold on, Brandon. You got to say that one more time. That was so good. You got to say that again. Reasonableness will always drive you to mediocrity because everyone has opinions as to what's reasonable. It's reasonable to go to college. It's reasonable to get a degree. It's reasonable to pick a profession. It's reasonable to work at a same business your whole life so you can retire there. It's reasonable to stay in the same little town and, and, and be comfortable. It's reasonable to this. It's reasonable to that. It's reasonable, reasonable. Everybody rationalizes reasonable in order to have an excuse to be mediocre. Mm. So 
I think it is absolutely unreasonable for a person like me in a little town in Corvallis, Oregon, to become a nine-figure earner. I think it is unreasonable. I think it's unreasonable for anybody listening to this to think that they deserve it. I think it's unreasonable for anybody listening to this to want to have it. I think it's unreasonable for anybody that's listening to this podcast to actually care what anybody else thinks. Mm -hmm. See, I moved from Portland, Oregon, just to get the hell away from the Pacific Northwest to Atlanta, Georgia at 18 years old mm -hmm. and walk up and down the sidewalk, Jimmy Carter Boulevard, selling ad space on the back of cards so I could feed myself. It was not reasonable. I could have stayed in Oregon and been fed by my parents. Mm -hmm. I could have got a good job in a little town where I lived. I could have lived a life of mediocrity. So it's highly unreasonable that a guy that's voted least likely to succeed should have succeeded. But the only reason I succeeded is because I became unreasonable and I did everything everyone told me I shouldn't do because I did not want to settle for being average. I love that. Oh, I love so, that. So be unreasonable. And just remember, everyone else that's trying to be reasonable, it's because when you're unreasonable and you actually break through, they have to look in the mirror and rationalize why they didn't have your courage or why they didn't have your risk tolerance or why they didn't have your leadership skills or why they didn't have something that allowed them to do what you just did. So instead, they'd rather keep you in mediocrity than have to look in the mirror and say to themselves, I'm not brave enough to be or bold enough to be unreasonable. Brandon, so oh my God, I, I want to throw my be, shoe at you right now. Be unreasonable. So good. So good. I want to hit you with my shoe. That's Let's how go. good everything you are saying is at this moment. Oh my goodness. Is checking your profit and loss statement and realizing that you've made $1 million in cash or more in your business in one year, your wildest dream? I've got just the book you need to give you a step-by-step -step framework to bring your dream to life and to position you to sustain it for years to come. Move to Millions, the book will take you from straddling the six-figure plateau to making, moving, and leaving millions, even if you have no idea where to start or how simple it can be. You can start your journey on the Move to Millions today by ordering your copy at movetomillionsbook.com. As soon as you place your order, Order, you will join our Move to Millions book squad and get access to exclusive bonuses that include getting to read the book now before your copy arrives once the book release. Go now to movetomillionsbook.com and join our book squad by getting your copy today. For those of you who are listening, I hope you just got your whole life and that I hope that you will declare that from this moment forward, you will be unreasonable. I love that, Brent. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. I have chills all over my body. I'm already thinking about how I can be even more unreasonable than I know I'm already being. I just love it. I love you. I know I've probably said that and, you know, I don't. Tell your wife I, I don't mean any harm, but I just think nah, she's good, man. She's good. She knows she's unreasonable. She's yes. willing to share me. Yes. You're you're the way you think is so refreshing. I think it's so easy to be a person who has gotten to where you have gotten and to just sit back and look down, but to inspire and to disrupt people to get out of their own way that they might get to live an unreasonable life and adopt a nine-figure mindset that would set them up to be on a trajectory to shift generational curses, to change the paradigm and establish the financial legacy that they want to leave in the world is just so amazing. Now, what are your thoughts on dealing with past failures or what someone perceives to be a failure in their life? And how can we navigate those moments that we were perceived to be you know, negative or blots on our white canvas, how can yeah, we so na navigate them about, more positively? I actually talk about the exact process that my mentor walked me through in my book to list out my assets mm -hmm. and to list out my liabilities and then find a way to convert my liabilities into bigger assets. It's a strategy. You know, I, I tell people law of attraction is a real thing. It's an absolute real thing, but it comes with applying an algorithm as does everything because nothing big or great comes to us in the form of an event, unless maybe you win the lottery, right? Right. 
happens through an algorithm. It's a process. It's a journey. So law of attraction happens with law of intention first. Like what is it you want to attract? Then it's law of action. You got to, you got to act. You got to move towards the stated objective, towards your goal, towards your commitment. And then only then do you attract it because manifested it. You made it happen. Okay. So sitting around hoping it happens, it's never going to happen. You got to take action towards a stated objective. And the more clear, concise, precise, and active you are in doing that, the higher probability you're going to attract it into your life. So understanding that that's my algorithm, what I did is I identified all the areas of my life. And all I can do, I can't tell other people how to live their life. I can just say what I did to overcome my own obstacles. And I talk about it in my book, that I converted my liabilities into huge assets through mentorship. And then I took my strengths, the natural God gifts that I did have, my courage, my resilience, my people used to say cockiness, but it was really, it was my internal way to break out and not be conformed. And I replaced that with confidence. I always had confidence in myself and my ability. And so when you replace those liabilities with a newfound asset. Like, how do I take that liability and convert it? I'll give you an example. I was told when I was younger, you know, the reason you don't do well in school is you have ADHD. Well, that has served me so well as an adult because when I was making sales calls and people were telling me, pound sand and hanging up because my ADHD, I didn't think two seconds about that. I was like, gotta make another phone call. So I was always moving forward. I never got bogged down with, oh my gosh, they hung up on me or told me. So the more I took action, even when met with resistance, I didn't, I didn't get bogged down by it. Right. Whereas in the school systems, they want to put pharmaceuticals in you, dumb you down, slow you down, conform you by medicating you. It's like, let just, that was a liability for me in school because everyone said it was a liability. It ended up being a huge asset for me as an adult because I never got bogged down in the details. I never overthought anything. I just took massive action, which is what Grant talks about. Mm -hmm. So what I'd say to you is in this book, I go through the exact process of how I reprogrammed my thinking, took charge of my brain, fed it, relative information that served me to take action towards a stated objective that I decided to take action and gave me the resources to have the courage to do it. And that's really what, in the nuance, that's really what this book is about. Mm -hmm. It's about learning to create your own future reality and owning that and not allowing anyone else to take that away from you. Yeah, that's so good. And such an important lesson. There was one thing you said as you were just Responding to that last question, you said, I converted my liabilities through mentorship. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I was a horrible leader. So what did I do? I found the number one leadership person on the earth, Dr. John Maxwell. He had three books that combined had 53 laws. and I put them all together and mastered the laws and created an algorithm for engagement. I wasn't a great operator. So I mastered Jim Collins, good to great, great by choice, how the mighty falls, Michael Gerber's E-Myth and put it all together and created an operating system. I wasn't good at money, so I share in lecture, cash flow quadrant. I learned the principles of moving from self-employed to to an owner-doer, to an owner-manager, and then to an investor, and really mastered that and then taught others to do it as well. So, So I took my weaknesses, and I learned from the best. Now, I had not met any of these people. I learned it through reading their books, which is why I finally, John Maxwell said, Brandon, if you don't write a book, you can't help people. Yeah, Not everyone's going to have time to sit in a room and talk to you. So you have to put your blueprint in a book so that people understand how you were able to break through and break out. And that's how you encourage and inspire people and you impact them. And so that's really why I ultimately wrote this book is not for me. I mean, I already know my story. It's for those that need to figure out how to create their story and to encourage them and to give them some principles on how I did it. And so... The interesting thing is every person that became a mentor through their body of work over the years, I've got to know them, developed relationships with them. And because I mastered their body of work and applied it and had success, your mentors will want to meet you when you take their work and you give them credit for it. I hate people who espouse all this knowledge. There's more bullshit. I'm sorry for using that word on social media. All these people, I mean, I have people come through my programs all the time or employees that used to work for me that... We effectively separated them from the company. And then all of a sudden, they're experts on things that they heard us talk about. So, you know, you just have the same 
watch, I can spot this a mile away. But unfortunately, other people are sometimes fooled by it. And what I'll tell you is go to the source. If you want to understand about the 10X rule, you should be hearing it from Grant Cardone. Correct. If yeah, you want to I... understand about nine-figure mindset, you should hear it from me. If you want to become an expert at being a leader, you should hear it from John Maxwell. You don't, or someone that's been endorsed by them as someone who's mastered their body of work. And for me, I've mastered the body of work with so many authors, I became their friends. And then in John Maxwell's case in 2013, I went in and actually helped him grow his business, Nice. working closely with him and his team. And I'm very close to them. And, and so I'm really proud that my authors, my mentors are also now all my friends. I love that. I think that there's so many lessons in what you just said, specifically around, you know, depending upon where you are. I talk a lot about operating from your vision point and not your vantage point, because your vantage point is always skewed. And what I feel like I'm hearing you say, as you talked about these lessons that you've mastered through reading books and turning them into a formula, an algorithm that you could then try, test, prove so that it's not theory and then ultimately leverage, leverage for yourself and then leverage for those that you serve. It all started by recognizing where it is that you desire to be. I loved the admission and the transparency that I was a horrible leader. Not many people are willing to admit their faults, their areas of opportunity in a way, but to turn them into true strengths and assets. I was reading about how the company that you ended up selling for 70 times EBITDA and how your approach to that company, it had to be because you learned how to become a phenomenal leader. Would you share the story about how you you decided that they didn't work for you, but you instead worked for them and the mindset behind that? Because I think that that's another success clue that will help some of these people that are listening that desire to become CEOs of companies that make, move, and leave millions, understanding the significance of leading in reverse, because sometimes I think that that's what we have to be willing to do. Yeah. So thank you for asking. I think what I learned because of my own deficiencies and obstacles and the things I had to confront with my first business and, and the mistakes I made is... I read something John Maxwell said, and it dawned on me. I wrote it down, and I wrote it down, and I wrote it down. It just became so blatantly obvious to me why I struggled in my first business and why I had the limitations that I had. I don't want to oversimplify this, but when I heard and read John Maxwell say, the only job of a leader is to make other people's success easy. Mm -hmm. It defined for me why I struggled, but it also gave me the code for my new business model back in 2004. It dawned on me, all I have to do is make other people's success easy, and then I'll be unbelievably successful. So then I made the list of all the things I screwed up because it was hard, and I said, if I could make it easy for other people to succeed at the things I failed at because it was hard, then more people would succeed. And if more people succeeded and I could figure out a way to monetize that, I would never need to ask anybody for money because everyone would want to give me money because I was helping them succeed. I should build a business model that helps business owners become successful. And for those people that trust me, I'm going to share my equity with them. I'm going to make them my partners. I'm not going to make them my employees. I'm not going to make them my customers. I'm going to make everyone my partner, my employees, become my partners, my customers become my partners, everybody's a partner. And that's why I say collaboration is the highest form of currency of any monetization that you can do. Because look, I don't need, I can go anywhere in this world and I can stay in somebody's home and I can be fed the best food in people's houses because I've impacted millions of lives around the world and everywhere I go, people want to repay to me. I don't need money, I need relationships. Yeah, And if you have relationships and you help those relationships monetize, then you have to be an example. If my job is to make other people's success easy and I can't learn to monetize, how can I help them monetize? So I have to be the living, breathing example. But as long as I can teach them how I'm monetizing and then they're winning, they don't care about how much I'm monetizing because I'm teaching them how to monetize. So when I have people come to Cardinal Ventures and I'm like, look, there's a lot of people out there saying they're gurus and building businesses and they're throwing big numbers around. And I've seen all that same stuff. And there's a few phenomenal people out there that are absolutely legit. 
but 99% of them are entirely full of crap. And so I'm like, look, you need to ask the right questions before you follow people's advice. There's just yeah. a lot of charlatans out there that have never done it. They're pretending to do it. What I know is this. I know that when you get, John Maxwell says, when you squeeze a tomato, you get tomato juice, mm -hmm. okay? There's a lot of these people presenting on social media that they're an orange and they have good tasting orange juice inside them, but they're not, they're a tomato. <laughs> At the end of the day, they haven't been squeezed because here's what I know about being an entrepreneur. It's in the absolute nuance of getting crushed with pressure and pain and anxiety and stress and fear and risk. It's in that moment where you have to make an A or a B decision. Yeah. And if somebody's never been in that moment, they don't know what the right choice is. I know you love the Move to Millions podcast. I know you can't wait every single week for me to drop a new episode. You know what that tells me? It tells me that you're also going to love my brand new book, Move to Millions, the proven framework to become a million dollar CEO with grace and ease instead of hustling grind. Listen to me. Everything you need to know to make millions of dollars without losing your shirt, your sanity, or anything that's important to you in the process is in this powerful book. It takes what you are experiencing each week on the podcast to the absolute next level. Go now to movetomillionsbook.com to grab your copy. They can pretend to teach you how to do it, but you know, because you got to ink sign behind you that in those moments of being crushed by the grace of God, sometimes you make the right decision. But the more people that can help us make the right decision, bigger, better, faster, more impactfully, the higher our confidence goes. And it's in the nuances. It's not in the general concept. This is a problem I have with going to college. I didn't go to college. I hire MBAs. I hire CPAs. I hire JDs. They don't know anything about the real world when they come out of school. So you have the degree, but until you actually apply it and you get crushed in the process of it and you learn from it and you dust yourself off and you get back in the batter's cage or batter's box or whatever, until you do that over and over and over, you really, you don't know. Yeah. You pretend you know, but you don't know. And you know what I'm talking about. The reason I wrote this book is because I'm bringing out the nuances Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the general concept of what it means to be a great leader. I'm talking about what I did because I sucked at leadership to create great leadership. The nuance of what I actually had to transform as a human being to create impact through other people, because that's a new one. And what I'll tell you is that tr I'm trying to help people understand, like, if you would have met me when I was 28, 29 years old, you would have said, this guy is unbelievable. He's got the world by the tail. He's breaking through glass ceilings. And I would have been able to tell you that I got it all figured out and I don't need nothing. Because I was in constant survival mode and I was winning every time I turned around until the thing I didn't know took it all away from me. Yeah, One little stupid, tiny mistake caused me to lose all of it. That if I'd have just asked the right mentor, the right advice or guidance, I would have never made that mistake because I had other options. Yeah. It's not what you know that gets you in trouble. And it's not what you know you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you don't even know is going to slam up against you at any given moment. And it's how you handle that and the wisdom and the guidance that you get from the right people by asking the right questions that will determine if you break through or not. Brandon, you all right with me. You are all right with me. This I'm excited and I, I'm, well, first I'm grateful. I'm grateful for, for the opportunity to even be sharing this time with you because I, I believe that you are brilliant. I can feel your passion and your energy. I know that you have lived it and that's why you can tell it with such conviction. I know your heart and your desire to help other people experience life at the next level. And I honor all of that and I honor you for that. And Thank I just you. want you to know me, my own little corner of the world is so grateful that you wrote this book. And I'm going to get a copy of it for all of my clients and my mastermind because I want them to learn from someone like you who has been there, done that, got the scrapes, bruises, and the t-shirts and have lived to tell the story that have the resilience to be able to lose it all and bring it all back 77 times more 
and to be able to help so many other people do the same exact thing. So I honor you so much. I'm so grateful that you found the time to stop by so that we could have this conversation. I know the book is available on Amazon. Where should we send folks so that they can learn more about you and grab multiple copies of this book so that they can bless other people with it as they finish out this year and prepare for next year? Absolutely. And and I shot three hours of content for this book for anybody that pre-orders it. It's free to them. If they go to nine, N-I-N-E, ninefiguremindset.com and they pre-order the book, Mm -hmm. they're going to get all that content for free. And I really break some things down in the book. And if they wait till after the book goes to market, which is September 19th. So I don't know when you're putting your podcast out, but it's in a couple of weeks. If they wait, then there'll be a charge for the content. So it's a savings of several thousands of dollars. And it's just my extra give to the audience. So ninefiguremindset.com. And it's N-I-N-E, not the number nine. Yep. And, And of course, you can follow me at Brandon M. Dawson on Instagram. Okay. And, and so, you know, those two ways you can easily find me and, and I just want you to know how much I appreciate you having me on your show. Absolutely. And we'll definitely make sure that we get this out in advance so people can take advantage of getting access to the book as soon as possible. Awesome. Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me on your show. It was good, wasn't it? I told you it was going to be good. Listen, I want you to get his book and you need to get it today, the day this episode drops, because if you wait until the book releases, your ability to get those extra bonuses, it goes away and you're gonna have to invest in order to access them. And that is not what I desire for you. I want you to get all the goodies and get them right now. There were so many powerful things that Brandon shared with us during this conversation. I really loved how he talked about converting his liabilities into bigger assets. You know, I even love the fact when he said that his mentors early on, John Maxwell and Jim Collins, he mentored with them through reading their books. Hint, hint. Not only should you get a copy of Move to Millions, but you also need a copy of Nine Figure Mindset. He said, collaboration is the highest form of currency. And you can't move around people. You have to move the business. And when you build a high value business system, you will transform lives at every level. When he said, I never overthought, I just took massive action. Y'all, he blew my wig back because I'm, just blown away at the things that he said that are very similar to what I said. In his own way, he talked about vision point versus vantage point. He said, reasonableness will always drive you to mediocrity. Oh, did that hurt? Did that hurt even a little bit? I felt like somebody might've got punched in the mouth when they heard him say that. So phenomenal, such an amazing conversation. We have all of his details in the show notes for you. Go grab that book as soon as, soon as possible, ASAP, so that you don't miss out on all of those powerful bonuses. And I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you for joining me for the Move to Millions podcast. If this episode has impacted you in any way, would you please take a moment and rate and review? Doing so helps us to deepen our impact and expand our reach around the world. And if you are ready to start your very own Move to Millions, I highly recommend that you order your very own copy of my brand new best-selling book, Move to Millions, the proven framework to become a million-dollar CEO with grace and ease instead of hustle and grind. You can get your copy and our bonuses today at movetomillionsbook.com. Until next time, remember, millions are your birthright, and to access them, you need only move. I'll see you next time. Thank you.